Welcome to Discovery Bay International School and our Examinations and Wellbeing Seminar. My name is Chiara and today Brett and I are going to be asking Mr. Roberts, our Deputy Head of Secondary, and Mr. Broderick, our Head of Wellbeing, to give us advice and tips on what we can do during our revision period to help us successfully prepare for the exam. Brett, would you like to kick us off? Of course. Um, Mr. Roberts, we are told that planning and organization are essential to ensure that we are well prepared for our exams. Can you tell us why this is so important? Thanks, Brett. Great question to kick us off. Absolutely. Planning and organization are, are critical. They're, they're paramount to the success that you will, I'm sure, achieve at the end of that exam series. What, the, what thorough planning and organization give any student is a platform for success. So the level of attention to detail, the thought that goes into the planning and the organization materials, that then gives us the opportunity to, to review what we need to in a timely fashion and to build those incremental steps towards progress. It helps us to set goals and helps us then to achieve those goals um, with, through thorough planning. Uh, and it, of course, achieving goals then builds success, builds confidence and really helps to set um, a really positive tone to a successful exam series. So absolutely critical. Um, Mr. Roberts, what are some of the key things to consider in terms of planning and organization? Great point. As Just to follow on from the first question from Brett, uh, a study timetable is really, really important. And mapping out a really thorough study timetable and revision schedule will help build those foundations, as we said before. So alongside that, of course, is that attention to detail. So thinking, thinking big, if you like, but working small, as I like to say. So that means thinking about all of the, the topics you have for your different subjects and all of the areas that you need to cover and recover in some instances, and then building those smaller steps into it. So they're really, really, really critical. Um, alongside that is building in those, that time throughout your day to make that happen and having that structure to your schedule as well. Mr. Roberts, our study environment is very important. I know that a quiet area works particularly well for me. What other considerations would you suggest for a desirable study environment? Great question, Brett. It's Everybody's an individual, of course, and, and what will work for one person won't necessarily work particularly well for another, but generally having a suitable learning space is really important. So many will have a desk in their bedroom, for example, that's a great thing to do in my mind, rather than sitting on a sofa or sitting on the bed to work. Having that space with your revision materials, your resources laid out is really, really useful. Alongside that, ideally it would be, for me certainly, and I know that'd be the case for many of yourselves as well, would be a quiet space, somewhere where there's no distractions. And by distractions, I mean maybe siblings you have in the house or even your parents, but distractions certainly from social media and devices as well. That's really, really important. So that environment would be conducive, if you like, to focus and having devices out the way, having a nice, quiet, sensible working space, which serves a purpose is really, really important. So great question. Thank you. Mr. Broderick, what would you say is the biggest distraction for students when attempting to study? Uh, when, I, when I was listening to Mr. Roberts, I just want to reiterate what he had to say. The two biggest distractions currently for this generation, but also for adults as well, are devices. And the relationship with the devices and the social media during the time of study. So I'd be really aware of those two areas. How am I using my device? And what social media am I in tune with at that particular time? Mr. Broderick, what advice would you give for students to try and manage this temptation? Well, it's, a, it's the same uh, advice I'd give to most people, regardless of those students or adults. You have to uh, have the boundaries in regards to putting that device away during the time that you need to study. And that takes a lot of self-control. You uh, really need to prioritize, um, you know, do I need this particular device for what I'm about to do? Um, is the time that I am spending online, is it definitely being related to what I am studying or am I just on it for private use? So once again, have boundaries for yourself and use your time wisely. Mr. Broderick, is there a set amount of time to attempt to study in one go? You know, I think this is very uh, personal to each person, but I would start with saying to each student, be realistic and have an awareness of your uh, abilities 
in regards to being able to stay focused. Now, there's a lot of research and, and the reasons why a lot of our classroom timetables are set this way is that a lot of a lot of people have difficulty being able to stay focused and remain focused with the intention for longer than 45 minutes. You know, I would even start before that, I'd be aware of how much time do I have available for this particular stint in regards to the study that I'm about to do. I know I have to be somewhere in uh, 30 minutes, then is the study that I'm going to be able to do be uh, before I need to leave going to be worthwhile? See, we need to be intentional about how much time we have available but also to be prepared to understand that actually, for some of us, if we take that 45 minute time frame, it's going to be more valuable if we broke that 45 minutes up into 15 minutes and have a five minute break in between each 15 minutes. There are certain techniques that you might want to look into called the Pomodoro te technique. Uh, and many other techniques for different individuals will work better, better than others. Uh, and definitely though, just remember, it's about what suits you and having a clear plan about the time that you have available. Mr. Roberts, when is the best time to study? Good question. It's, it's a nice little uh, tangent there from uh, Mr. Broderick as well, really. Um, again, this is very personal. Um, there's actually a bit of research out there that suggests that teenagers don't necessarily function too well in the morning, and they do function a little bit better in the afternoon. But again, it's, it's down to personal needs. Um, your goals for that day, as we touched on a few moments ago, because, again, it's, it's very much about the individual and what you hope to achieve in that period of time, as Mr. Broderick said, and over the period of that day as well. If you are not certain as to when you function best as an individual and when you can focus best, again, there might be some external factors there if you're at home with family, et cetera, but explore those couple of options. So, for example, try having a few shorter periods in the morning and see how that works for you. Similarly, try a period in the evening or late afternoon and see and weigh that up almost and see which function, which serves a better purpose for your needs, your goals of that day, uh, and which you feel that suits you best, I suppose. Mr. Broderick, many teenagers believe that sugary foods and drinks will keep them alert while studying. Is this accurate? You know, I, I wouldn't want to be uh, giving advice in regards to what a, uh, a student should be eating. Um, I think that's once again, really individualized. But when it comes back to nutrition, there definitely is a lot of research around what does work best. You know, I, I think it's coming back to having a balanced approach and being uh, having moderation in regards to what is being eaten. And, and you know, once again, you, you specifically mentioned sugary drinks. Moderation. Well, sugary foods and drinks certainly give us that short immediate burst of energy if you like so um sugar does provide us with energy absolutely however um one thing i would say is moderation certainly throughout the course of the day but more so is that 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 consumption of uh, whether it's fizzy drinks or high sugar foods etc is going to give you um, a real high in terms of energy but then it's very soon after it's going to give you a very very um, sort of obvious low if you like so those peaks and troughs in terms of energy and will be very noticeable um, and will have an impact on what you want to achieve and your levels of focus. So what I would say is, is please be mindful of your diet during this period. It is important. There are certain associated brain foods, if you like, nuts, berries, seeds, fish, um, which are proven to help memory and help concentration and focus. So certainly having a balance to your diet is important. One thing I would say is, we also need to be very conscious at those periods when we're looking to focus of the amount we're drinking in terms of water. Keeping hydrated is incredibly important because it helps sustain a nice level of concentration. It actually keeps our mood up as well. So um, something to think about in that regard. But again, balance is important and I would reiterate having sufficient foods that will enable you to, to focus for a period of time, sustained period of time as well, without those peaks and troughs. Mm. Mr. Broderick, what about the benefits of exercise? Should this be a priority if we're preoccupied and worried about exams? Oh, Brad, I, I, well, great question, because I'm a huge supporter of this particular facet. You know, I, I look at this as one of the key pillars, actually, that's underestimated to the effect that it has. Uh, I would encourage all students 
to put into their study timetable uh, a, a de designated time where they're going to go out and get some exercise, you know, with where their heartbeat is uh, raised. And this is for a period of time uh, longer than 20 minutes. The benefits that this will add to the big picture in regards to exam stress and study, it can never be underestimated. It kicks in our endorphins, uh, oxytocin and dopamine, and it puts us in a mindset where our mood is at an optimum to be ready to study and our stress levels have decreased. And we're going to be in that mindset and in that zone to just get done what needs to be done. So, Brett, I highly encourage you. Mr. Roberts, what about learning priorities? How should I approach revising all of my subjects? Good question, Kiara. Again, it depends how much you've got to cover and the depth you've got to cover, of course. But there are a few essential tools to support us prioritizing what we need to and when we need to, of course. We mentioned before a study timetable. That's absolutely critical. And mapping out, mapping big but working small, so identifying those number of topics we've got to cover, the key areas we've got to cover, and how much time we need and are prepared to dedicate to them. Alongside that, I would really start to consider using some of the published information of the exam board, such as the syllabus, making sure you're checking off what you need to cover and what's associated with that paper or that component. Past papers are really, really useful too. Alongside that, the mark schemes to cross-reference your, your success and how close you are to achieving those desired outcomes really, really important. Um, and of course, prioritizing what you need to when you need to um, and giving yourself ample time to do that. So starting early is also really important, avoiding cramming therefore, um, and really making sure that you've dedicated sufficient time to not cover something at surface level, but to cover it at the deeper level you need to, mm -hmm. to respond suitably in an exam as well. So it's really giving it that thought. So to, to sum summarize that, I would say, Start big, um, work small, start early, and utilize key resources and materials you need to. Uh, and alongside that, of course, get your notes in order. That's really important. Mr. Roberts, are there any particular strategies that you would recommend to consolidate learning and retention? Good question, Brett. Yes, I would say, and again, people, are, people have different approaches and different levels of focus. Um, I personally would certainly avoid relentless reading and reading and reading. I would keep revision sessions um, as engaging and active as possible. Uh, and what I mean by that, I suppose, is, is being creative with how we present information, how we try and recall information, whether that's mind maps, whether that's flow charts, whether that's flashcards, anything to help us engage further with the topic. And another useful tool is often trying to explain what you want to present on paper. So a desired answer, if you like, a desirable answer to, um, to a sibling at home, to mum or dad, and really try and teach that topic to someone else even. Um, it can be quite a useful strategy to really consolidate what you're trying to learn um, and execute it in a desirable fashion as well. Mr. Roberts, are there any benefits to studying with friends? Good question. I, I believe so, certainly. Um, the first thing I would say to that, of course, is, the goal for you and your friends is to make sure that's a disciplined, focused period of time with a goal assigned to it. So the temptation, of course, as we know, when we're, when we're with our friends is to lose focus, um, to, to chat about stuff that's not relevant. So I would really encourage you and or your friends to, to use that time sensibly and form a study group almost, absolutely, um, but with clear intentions, clear goals, and utilizing some of those strategies we said before about maybe teaching your buddy, um, testing each other, little quizzes between yourselves. Those are really useful strategies to help consolidate learning. Um, so, yes, there is significant merit in working with friends, but putting the conditions and the boundaries in place first to make sure that you achieve those goals. Otherwise, it can often be invaluable time and often a waste of time if you don't have that in place. Mr. Broderick, is it okay to socialize still with friends and or family? Yeah, I like exercise. I'd encourage it. No, another area where, it's, where it offers balance to what you're going through at that time. You know, when we get out there and spend time with good friends, 
we're able to put everything into clarity and socializing is part of that. But once again, it's about balance. Too much socializing is going to have an effect on the end outcome of how much time you spend studying. So individual, of course, but always have clarity towards the intention of what you're doing during this uh, period of time. Mr. Robert, should I be worried if one of my closest friends appears so confident all the time? They always seem to have all the answers and they don't ever seem stressed. Not necessarily worried. I would be worried if you feel that you've not achieved anywhere near your goals in terms of your own intentions, but not comparing to anybody else. Absolutely not. Um, people respond differently to stresses. They respond differently to pressures. People learn very differently. So what works for you and the time it takes you to, to consolidate your learning and to cover certain topics, is going to look very different to somebody else in, in many cases. And so I don't, I don't believe it's too healthy to compare, certainly. Um, you set your goals out, you map out your intentions, and you work in the, in the strategies that work for you. And hopefully you've explored a few of them to make sure you're confident you know what does work for you. And you keep committed to those goals and work to that effect. So, of course, you'll have some of your friends saying that, um, yeah, I'm, I, I believe I know that. I'm really far ahead with this. Um, and I try not to take too, pay too much attention to that. It's good to connect with your friends, as we said before. But the priorities are, are you getting where you need to go and navigating that journey successfully for you and what works for you. Mr. Roberts, what can my parents do to support me? Right, that's a great question. Um, they can do a significant amount. The, the environment in the household is, is going to be a, certainly a contributing factor to your stress, your well-being, and your ability to cope throughout this period. So I would say first and foremost, be a presence, be available. And I know Teenagers may have different relationships at different times with their parents. Sometimes we can be quite frustrated with our parents. Sometimes we, we need to lean on them for support. So what I'd say from a parent's stance is be present, be available, reach out to your, to your children who are under significant pressure at this time. Um, there'll be times when they might want to talk to you. Um, I wouldn't encourage pressing them too much on it, but I'd constantly remind them that you're there should they need you. Um, and you're there to support them. Um, alongside that, I would encourage your parents to encourage you to remember those healthy habits we talked about as well in terms of exercise, diet, that work and study space, and really respecting that and encouraging that. Um, I know many of you will have siblings at home, so it's really trying to, from a parent point of view again, ensure that, that environment is really conducive to learning uh, when I know many of the apartments we live in around here are quite small, of course, aren't they? And so it's, it's supporting you on that front as much as anything. So for me, um, those parameters and those boundaries, really trying to reinforce them and support you with them, those healthy habits and being a presence as and when you need it. Mr. Broderick, what can be done to ease the tension in a household during these difficult times? Tension can happen during these times, absolutely, especially in households where there's uh, many members. Okay, some tips. Communication, clarity, and preparation. Let's call it the CCP. What do I mean by this? Communication. Talk with mum and dad. Talk with your brothers and sisters. And, and in a way, set out a stall. You know, it's all about knowing where that learning environment is. Mr. Roberts just talked about it a moment ago. You know, this is this is going to be the area where I keep all my uh, materials. This is the area where I, I need to be left alone. Okay, and, and you know, communicating that with the family members, getting the okay, um, providing clarity. What does clarity look like? Have you shared your timetable with mum and dad, with your brothers and sisters, so that they're aware of, you know, when the exams are happening, when's your study? You know, I'd really encourage you to have uh, Monday to Friday sorted out a week ahead. So on a Sunday, sit down, look at your Monday to Friday, and then share that with mum and dad or other members of the family so that they know the particular times where you've already set out where you're going to be studying so that they could look at their timetable as well and say when things are not going to work because what is that doing that's about preventing when things may go towards the negative all right so communication clarity and planning 
And as Mr. Roberts mentioned, I just mentioned, it's very important. I grew up with five other brothers in a two bedroom house. You know, we we're all very similar age. And we we're fighting over uh, tabletops and areas to be. So that's really important that our family members know this is my area. This is where all my things are going to be. That takes away that stress anxiety for when you're in a rush. And a question for Mr. Roberts and Mr. Broderick. If parents are concerned about their child or would like to learn more about strategies to support their children, what should they do? Great, great question. We, um, we have shared documents associated to exam schedules and stuff with, with those respective parents and year groups. And there are many, what we would say, uh, strategies, um, considerations within those documents. So first and foremost, by all means, look at them, see if they make sense, try and understand them. But I would say as much as anything, if, if any of this needs more clarity um, or you need some support in trying to work this out with, with as a family, please reach out to us. And we're here to support you in whatever way we can. I'm going to uh, support what Mr. Roberts has said, but also to mums and dads, uh, caregivers. One thing that I'd strongly encourage you to do is you have experienced these uh, particular situations. And sometimes it's from our experiences, whether they were positive or negative, that we'll have our own particular assumptions about what is happening. So I'd strongly encourage you that if you're you know, observing your child and they're not doing what you would hope that they should be doing or think they should be doing, communicate that. Or step back and reflect and ask yourself, you know, when I observe my child, do they look that they look like they're in a in a healthy space? Um, are they asking for assistance? Have I asked them do they need assistance? But I'm going to support what Mr. Roberts said. We are here to help, and I always will be willing to sit down with you and take the time necessary so that we can work together as a collaborative team and uh, making sure that our young people have that best chance in regards to their exams. Thank you so much for your time. I know this definitely helped me. I'm sure it helped Kiara and anyone else out there.